Welcome everyone. So today we have Martin Wistova from Amazon Web Services in Berlin. And uh, yeah, Martin will present his work on QShot, BO with deep kernel surrogates. And Martin has done his PhD at the University of Hildesheim in Germany. And then he's been, yeah, in uh, IBM research in Dublin before joining Amazon. So looking forward to your talk, Martin, and the floor is all yours. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. I hope everything works. Given that you started, I assume you can see my screen. Um, yeah, let's jump right into it. Um, yeah, I think the, the first part might be a bit boring for most of you, uh, but I will start anyway with it because it introduces some of my notations, so it might be easier to follow. Um, so yeah, as you all know, machine learning, we have sensitive hyperparameters, we want to tune them, and Bayesian optimization is one way of doing it in an automated fashion. Um, and what we do usually when we use Bayesian optimization is we simply assume that we have some sort of black box function f, and that black box function gets as an input an x and returns some value. And we want to, in this case, now minimize that function. And um, yeah, for hyperparameter optimization, basically our input x, these are the hyperparameters that we set and the output will be some validation score. And then evaluating that function basically means we use these hyperparameter settings in order to train on some data and then use the trained model to validate on some validation data and compute that score that we return. So this is a computationally expensive task. And there have been a couple of approaches to make this faster. One of course are like multi-fidelity tasks. What we will look into in this talk, however, um, is the idea of transferring knowledge um, from observations on other tasks with the same model um, to a new data set to, to improve the speed. And um, so yeah, that assumes that we sort of have like for some task one to T, we have um, observed for some hyperparameters X, um, the validation scores wise and they might be learning curves, but single scores are sufficient for us here. And that means for each of these tasks, we basically have black box functions f1 to ft. And now um, there's this new black box function f, which we want to optimize. And we, we can use these partial observations on f for that purpose. Um, and maybe later, let's start with the, the motivation here. And I, I hope you can follow me here because it's quite a bit of a jump. So um, some of you guys who, who are familiar with few short learning and meta learning, they, they might be familiar with this example already, the sine wave example, because that's like the traditional example people use for um, few short learning. Um, so the idea of this work was basically to just assume that what we do in hyperparameter optimization is sort of a few short tasks. So there we have seen a couple of related tasks. Um, and now we usually can afford to evaluate only few hyperparameters in order to reconstruct actually the um, entire um, response function or our black box function. And in the um, bottom left here, these colorful sine waves, um, they basically represent um, the black box functions we know of. And there will be now a new um, sine wave function, um, this dark blue one here, which we want to optimize. And of course, um, this is just a simple example. Um, so we picked a family of sine wave functions, but the model that is learning um, isn't aware that this is a sine wave function where you actually only have to learn this A and B, uh, which would fully define that function, but instead it's a neural network without making any assumptions here. But it's able to use those functions to learn um, some sort of bias. Um, and yeah, this example basically shows you, so, so in contrast to standard um, few shot meta learning, um, here, of course, we want to use Bayesian optimization. So we need to have a Bayesian model. Um, so ours will be based on a GP Gaussian process. 
And this little example shows you how it works. So this is like the standard um, Bayesian optimization um, sequence that you typically know. The difference now is that the surrogate model here is basically um, meta-learned. Um, and um, I hope you can see that, that it's with relatively few examples can actually fit the sine wave um, quite accurately. And the hope is um, that that will allow us to um, find good hyperparameters faster in practice. Um, so some preliminaries before we jump into the method. Um, so yeah, our method will be based on a Gaussian process. Um, so of course we need some training data for that. We have seen that before um, the notation. And then our uh, then we assume basically that um, we have random variables yi, and they are multivariate Gaussian distributed. So um, our GP basically depends on some mean function here, which is usually some constant. So we can ignore that, and then it's just um, depending on the uh, um, the covariance function. Okay, and that covariance so this kernel function might have parameters. Um, so how do we define that kernel function? Oftentimes that's simply manually chosen like turn kernels or RBF ones um, popular for um, hyperparameter optimization. But in the literature there um, was also the idea of deep kernel learning. What that means is basically what you do is you apply a transformation um, phi on your input x um, before you pass it to like a standard kernel, like an RBF kernel. And this function phi is parameterized by some um, parameters w. And that could potentially be any function. Um, but yeah, for simplicity, one would use a neural network instead. And now we could, I mean, we have more flexibility, so we are able to learn um, our kernel instead of manually crafting it. Um, and we would now have to estimate two types of um, kernel parameters. One are the, the standard kernel parameters of this kernel around these, and then there are the um, parameters W, which are the neural network parameters. Um, yeah, so what we do in a few short Bayesian optimization is basically um, only a small thing, if you want. Um, that is, we replace the standard surrogate model, the GP, for example, with a specific type of um, GP um, that uses the steep kernel I just mentioned. And there's another difference that is um, not trained in a standard way, um, but it's using a few short training scheme we will have a look at later. Uh, both are things that, uh, that we didn't come up with in the paper, but that's more something um, that you can find in the literature. And then the objective is to yeah, find our uh, kernel parameters by using uh, maximizing um, the log marginal likelihood of all the tasks we have. Um, so yeah, well, what are the components we still um, need to discuss before actually understanding how the whole um, method works? So it's a few short methods. So we must select some initial few shots, right? How do we do that? Um, then this is maybe yeah, not really specific for this algorithm, but we also addressed um, how we can make our surrogate model label scale invariant. What that means is um, typically you don't really care about what the actual scores are for the different hyperparameters, but rather their ranking. Um, that needs to be dealt with somehow. Typically people use some sort of scaling or normalization, which yeah, doesn't really do the trick. Um, but yeah, um, and then finally, how do we actually train our surrogate model? Um, yeah, for the initialization, uh, one could potentially use anything. Um, so you could use random points, for example, 
But of course, there will be a waste of um, data, right? Since we have these previous observations on other data sets, we could use it. Um, so what we want to find is um, a set of initial configurations that does well on the previous tasks. Um, so formally defined, that's what we used to see in equation six. And for simplicity, you can just ignore here the um, denominator and uh, this part of the numerator and just pay attention to the F here. So basically what we want to have, so this set X here is our um, yeah, candidate set of initial points. And we take that configuration out of those which minimizes um, this black box function here. And um, so the overall objective is minimization, right? Um, and then we basically sum over all these tasks and want to find this set of initial points that overall minimizes um, the, the, the loss. And um, the remaining part here, that's basically just some sort of normalization um, that's been applied on the losses. Um, to account for different scales in um, the different data sets. Um, yeah, one important note here is, of course, that we don't have access to F, T, right? We only have partial observations. To overcome that, one could use a surrogate model. Um, you could train your own one. What we basically do is we simply reuse um, our few short model that we anyway trained on the data. So we could simply use that to impute um, the missing FT of axis. Um, so that becomes now a combinatorial problem, right? We have a set of I many elements and we want to find that that minimizes equation six. Um, yeah, you could potentially also solve that um, however you want. Um, we address that um, by using a simple evolutionary algorithm uh, with very simple operations, one being a mutation where we basically just replaced one element in this set with a random other one. And then a crossover operation where we would take two um, good performing candidate sets and yeah, choose random elements from those to create a new one. Um, and yeah, that's how you get your initial set of um, configurations you would try. Um, the task augmentation I mentioned earlier, that's basically something we do on the fly when training. Um, what we want to do is that given one task that is between some upper and lower threshold, we want to rescale it in such a way that it has a new upper and lower threshold. Um, however, the this, this also means that the ordering doesn't change, right? So it's literally just messing with the Ys without actually changing the order um, of hyperparameters with respect to the ranking. And that allows us to basically come up with random tasks, which are still based on some real tasks. Um, yeah, and this is how the overall algorithm looks like. Um, so this is mostly what you see here is the meta um, learning, um, uh, meta training algorithm, uh, plus the um, the task augmentation we saw earlier. So what you would do is you sample some task among those that we have, um, then you sample new lower and upper thresholds uh, for the task augmentations. And then for BN times, you basically sample a couple of batches, um, do the task augmentation, and then simply compute the marginal likelihood and update your um, kernel parameters. Um, that's it. And yeah, that's that's so much about the algorithm, right? So now we have all those different components, how to get the first ones. Um, then we use our trained model to uh, simply, yeah, recommend you once in the traditional way how you would do it in Bayesian optimization, right? Our surrogate model would give us a prediction of mean and standard deviation. We would use expected improvement to find the most promising ones, um, evaluate them and yeah, continue. 
Um, in order to evaluate that, we had in the original paper look into three different benchmarks. These are the first three ones. Um, the first one is a rather small and old one. We mostly used it uh, because it was used um, in one of the most recent baselines we considered. And this baseline actually faced a couple of um, problems in our setting. So in order to yeah, make sure the cast uh, the, the 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 reviews and the readers have trust in our results, uh, we added this one as well and had a deeper analysis why that method actually isn't um, working that well. I will um, not discuss that in this talk, but if you want, you can have a look into the paper and we also see it later in the results that the method is really bad. Um, that's why we added that one. Um, the fourth data set is maybe an interesting uh, addition. Um, so this is like an experiment that was um, run by Joseph Kabotska and his team. Um, I wasn't able to share my algorithm for legal reasons, so they re-implemented it. They um, used their own data set and uh, some different baselines. So this is, I wouldn't say like completely um, independent experiment since I'm a co-author of that paper, uh, but still, I guess that's as close as you can get as a uh, author, I guess. Uh, which should give us um, a little bit more trust into reproducibility of this method. Um, so yeah, the, the HBO methods we used um, as a baseline in the paper were random search. I don't think I need to say anything to that. Then we have a Gaussian process with the matern kernel, um, two variants of it, one where we initialize with the Latin hypercube sampling, and another one where would we would use the same warm starting that we use for our method. Um, then we used MetaBO as a baseline that was at the point, um, um, yeah, a very recently published uh, method, basically on the same conference a year before. Um, we also compared against ABLR, which is also well published and very similar to our method since it's also based on a GP um, with a deep kernel. Uh, the main difference being that it yeah, uses actually a linear kernel on the neural network instead of a nonlinear one. And also it's not using meta learning and it's that you have for each task um, your own GP hat. Um, then we have like as a transition towards FSBO, um, some sort of thing that is close to ABL, ABLR, um, but it uses um, the kernel and the training as used um, in FSBO. And FSBO I just explained, right? Maybe some technical details here. So for this um, phi function, we simply use the two layer neural network with 100, 28 units, real activations, and a squared exponential kernel around that. So nothing fancy. Um, and these are our first results. Um, so as mentioned, three different data sets. On the x-axis, we have the number of trials, um, depending on the data set up to 100. And on the y-axis, we report the normalized regret, meaning for each data set, we, um, yeah, normalize the regret to zero and one to average over them um, in the end. And this is what we see here. And um, yeah, I mentioned earlier that one of our baselines has quite a bit of problems. That's MetaBO and you see basically that's giving us almost horizontal lines here, um, which is a bit unfortunate. Um, yeah, what we can see also is that FSBO looks quite promising here on all three tasks at the bottom. Um, we have also a different view on these results here in a tabular format, um, where we basically now slice across the picture we saw earlier, like at different trials, and now report the rank 
um, the average rank um, and we applied some statistical significance tests here. So whatever you see in bold just means this is like the lowest rank, meaning the best rank and um, everything that's in italics, that means it's not significantly worse than the best method. So for example, we see here that um, GP bomb started after 15 trials isn't significantly worse than FSP bomb. Um, yeah, however, in most cases it is um, statistically significant. Well, uh, yeah, that's that's the next um, benchmark, mostly run by uh, Sebastian and Hardy. Um, yeah, it's it it's a very similar picture. We have now a couple of different baselines here. So to point out the transfer ones, these are like um, these TAF, TST, ABLR, and RGP. These are the transfer ones. Uh, but overall, um, the picture is very similar, showing that AFSBO is doing quite well. Um, and I think in their scenario, they, they didn't even use the warm starting. Um, they gave all methods the same, same initialization. Um, so now there will be a few ablation studies to yeah, shed some light on what the contributions of the different components are. So this is mostly on components here. So maybe let me explain that first. So a multi head GP is basically, um, yeah, this, which should be close to ABLR, but it's rather our implementation. So there's no meta learning. We have one head for each task and no warm starting. Um, then we see in the green line here, that's when we add warm starting to it. That will, um, as one would expect, improve. Um, and then we also have here additionally fine tuning, which in some cases improves. Um, then we have FSBO here without fine tuning, just a warm start. So that basically adds to this method um, the meta learning and it's also using only one GP so that there, there, there are not multiple hats and we see also across the board that from green to pink that's an improvement and similarly we see the same for our actual final method we see an improvement from FSBO in pink to this one but also from the orange line to this one so it seems like all these um, additions make sense um, we also had a look into how useful the warm start actually is and compared against um, two other um, commonly used methods, which is just random and let in hypercube sampling. And yeah, I don't think it's surprising to see that warm start actually works better. Um, that's what we would expect. Um, the difference, uh, I mean, Ada Boost is here the exception that could potentially be because the search space is relatively small, only two hyperparameters um, that the warm start is not necessarily needed. Not sure about that though. And yeah, and this is our last ablation study, which might be interesting. So for those of you who are more familiar with these different meta learning approaches out there, um, they might be familiar with Marmel and Reptile, um, which we didn't use in our approach. Um, we refrain from comparing against mammal because that's computationally expensive, but we compared against Reptile. And at least in our comparison, they perform very similar. Um, ours has a little bit better results, but I've discussed with some others um, and they observed that Reptile works better for them in their type of few shot learning so not for our algorithm but their variants um, so yeah it seems to be a legit uh, alternative um, yeah I tried to 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 give some further pointers so these are uh, works that um, also use few shot learning and Bayesian optimization um, there's this recent work that was I think one year after ours uh, which basically applied um, this idea to the acquisition function instead of the surrogate function. So they learn some sort of um, 
So it's a um, reinforcement learning idea where you would use learn this policy to to basically recommend new hyperparameters. And then um, I guess the second one here is a more straightforward extension to our work uh, where we would additionally learn some sort of meta features um, that yeah, represent data sets uh, um, directly, which also showed promising results and improvements of ours. And yeah, so I think I can conclude now. So I tried to show you what we did and, um, and that this few short learning could be an interesting angle to Bayesian optimization and maybe a different perspective. Um, I shared with you some of our experimental results that indicated that it seems to do well. And uh, I tried to give you some pointers to some early adoption of this idea. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, do you have any questions? <laughs>